Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Sometimes we like to venture out into the deep, dark forests and the wild wilderness to be at one with nature itself. But, as I'm sure a lot of you are currently out camping or hiking on your bank holiday weekend, as the sun dips over the horizon and the shadows grow, out of each corner, out of each crevice. Who knows what lurks, watching, waiting for you to close your eyes. Tonight's show is a compilation of scary stories from deep in the Everglades, the wild wilderness, the forests of the USA. I hope you guys enjoy these stories as much as I. Of course, as ever, please do let me know down below in the comments. As ever, please do like and share. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's first story, entitled Encounter in the Everglades. I am a 24-year-old man. I live in Florida, and I especially enjoy hunting out in the Everglades. I mostly try hunting for deer, but it's always nice catching some feral python once in a while. While hunting, I encountered something that made me question the true nature of reality. On one particular day, I decided to hunt for some deer alone. The hardware store that I was working at went out of business a week ago. Because I lost my job and I was bored, I decided to go on a short hunting camping trip. I packed up a sawed-off shotgun, a 4 5 caliber pistol, a bowie knife, and a Mossin Nagant rifle. With food, I got some ramen noodles, some eggs and hot dogs. I also packed a sleeping bag and a tent. I was planning on spending four days out in the Everglades. So, I got into my old pickup truck and I drove to the Everglades. I parked in a nearby grassland and I walked into the swamp with my gear. It took me around three hours to find the perfect place to set up camp. I rested for another two hours until I decided to go hunting for some deer. That is when shit started to get strange. I had this uneasy feeling that I was being watched. No matter how hard I tried, I could never shake off that feeling. I didn't succeed in killing any deer, but I did catch a few rabbits. Sometimes, I heard big twigs snapping or footsteps behind me. But when I went to investigate, nothing was there. So I just went back to my business, skinning the rabbits that I caught. Soon, the night was coming up and I got tired. I decided it was my time for me to fall asleep. So, I unfolded my sleeping bag and closed my eyes. As soon as I was struggling to sleep, I hear this deep, demonic growl. I quickly grabbed my sword off shotgun in preparation to defend myself. Suddenly, something slashes at my tent. The slash tears a very large hole in the tent's fabric. I respond by firing three shots at the intruder. The intruder responds with a very high pitch and ear-piercing scream. The assailant screams so loud that it drowned out the freaking gunshots. Whatever attacked my tent started running like hell towards the other direction. I was too frightened and shaken up to give chase. My ears felt like they were bleeding from the thing's screams and the gunshots of my shotgun. I spent the rest of that night sitting next to a tree with a gun in my hand. I did not get a good look at my would-be attacker due to how dark it was out. However, from the brief glimpse of the silhouette that I got, the figure seemed quite humanoid, but it definitely was not a human. Also, that thing was definitely not a bear, because it was far too skinny and gaunt to be one. Whatever it was, it was very thin and skeletal in build. I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me or not, but I swore that the assailant had a deer-like head. The morning came, and I investigated the area for signs of my late night visitor. For some strange reason, there wasn't any blood near my camp. I know for certain the fact that I actually hit that thing at nearly point-blank range. After walking around the area for a few minutes, I discovered some footprints. They were definitely bipedal, but not human. The footprints had four toes with very large dagger-like claw marks on each end. My guess is that they came from my little friend. I panic and I decide it's time to leave, so I started to pack up all of my gear. The tent, due to it being badly damaged to be useful from last night's attack, was simply left behind. I carefully scanned my environment for the creature. 
After I packed up all of my stuff, I started the long walk back to my truck. A hunting trip is not worth risking my life. As I'm walking, I carefully watched the Everglade environment around me. I scanned every body of water and every tree I could see for signs of that monster. There was always that unsettling feeling in my gut. All of my hairs on the back of my neck were standing up after nearly three hours of walking in the forest. I suddenly hear a loud crunching noise coming from behind me. When I turned around to look, it was the same creature from the night before. The beast looked like a rotting corpse, with its ribcage and internal organs visible. Its head was a pale white deer skull, but with razor sharp teeth. The creature's claws were around four inches long. It was deeply emaciated and a thin creature. Most chilling of all were its soul piercing eyes. I fire another round at the creature with my Mozin Nagant, but this time it was unfazed. Realising that my firearms were now useless against the creature, my flight instincts take in and I run for my life. Within no time, the creature is running right behind me. I hear the creature's heavy breathing on my neck just when all hope was lost. I saw my truck across the nearby grassland. I was within yards of the swamp's end. However, even with all of my adrenaline pumping, I was deeply fatigued and exhausted from all of that running, despite nearly fainting. I summoned enough energy to sprint to my truck. Just as I reached my truck, I feel a heavy blow hit the left side of my body. I was sent flying a few feet. When I landed on the ground, I ended up spraining my leg badly. The creature walked over to me, and then it grabbed my shirt's collar with one hand and hoisted me up in the air. I pulled out my 4.5 and shot it in the face. The creature dropped me to the ground. I then grabbed the moss in the gant and started beating the beast with the butt of my rifle. After seeing me fighting back, the creature scampered back into the swamp as if it had its tail between its legs. After the creature fled, I limped back to my truck. I put all of my gear on the truck's bed. Then I climbed into my truck and speed off as fast as I can. I never return to that part of the Everglades again. The Thing in the Woods This happened to me about 15 years ago. When I used to live in Park Ridge, there was a lake not far from my house near a forest preserve called Bellu Lake, which was a popular fishing spot. There was a gravel path that ringed the lake, which is about a mile in area, and at the far end of the lake, furthest from the parking lots when you pull in off the main road, there was a forested area, which went in a ways called the Bellu Woods. I used to enjoy jogging around the lake in the early morning or late afternoon just before the preserve closed. This one day, it was a beautiful sunny and fairly warm, and I'd gotten to the far end of the lake where the forest began. I really needed to pee. The outhouse was by the parking lot on the opposite end, and since I didn't see anyone fishing except right by the shallower end near the parking lot, where I saw a couple of older guys, I found an opening in the woods and took the dry mud path about 20 feet in or so, and looked for a tree to do my thing. I noticed how quiet it was in the woods. There were no birds, no rushing of cars from the nearby highway. I could almost hear my own breathing. I finished up and turned back onto the path when I felt a strange feeling, like I wasn't alone, although I couldn't see anyone around. And it also began to feel ominous, and the hair on the back of my neck started to stand up. I took the path around the bend where a large pine tree stood, and came around the corner to see something that was burned into my mind. About 10, 12 feet down the path was something that looked all black, sort of shaped like an old-fashioned bedsheet ghost, touching the ground, and no features I could make out. But it swayed to the left and then to the right, again and again like a pendulum. I guessed it had to be about six feet tall, maybe a foot or so wide, and very black, like ink. It made no sound whatsoever. After about what felt like minutes, but was probably not even a minute, I noticed it was now closer than it originally was to me. Though I don't recall seeing it move, and I know I didn't move, it had stopped swaying and was standing motionless. It took all I could to gather my wits, turn my back on it and race down the path, hoping to find the opening in the woods that I'd come in. Which I did in record time. I was momentarily blinded by the sunshine outside the woods, but kept running down the path, ringing the lake, not daring to look behind me. Until I got to the parking lots and into my car. Only then did I look to see if it had followed me. But of course, I didn't see anything. I had no clue what I had just seen, but I was shaken still, 
and I had to calm down a few minutes before I could drive. I did go back to Lake Bellu after that jog a couple more times, but never ever again dared to go back into those woods after that experience. Dogman encounter during a camping trip. Let's get straight into that. Hello, my name is Shaggy Satir, but you can call me Shaggy for short. I'm going to recant a story of mine that I can tell, rarely. My own family don't even know about this, and while that might sound weird to you, trust me, it makes more sense to tell the internet strangers than people I'm forced to be around. Mr. Xtremes, an amazing narrator, once read this story for his channel, and I'm happy with the discussion it got. But I believe it is time to rewrite the story to clear up confusions. So, without further explanation, let's get into my story. This happened when I was much younger. I'd have to ask my parents when the camping trip happened to tell you how many years ago it was, but I can assure you it was at least a decade. Now, I'm going to use some more questionable words for describing the location. Words like wooded and wilderness reserve because I don't know the best words for this thing. Around a decade ago a friend from church asked me to join his family on a camping trip to the wilderness reserve called Oasis State Park. Of course since this was my best friend and his family had always been nice, I said yes. Up until that point I had only camped rarely, so the prospect of camping with a friend and his family seemed absolutely amazing. So. We began preparing for a weekend when I wasn't busy. I got my own tent, my own sleeping bag and my own supplies. Once all of that was gathered, the father of the friend came and picked me up and my parents waved me off. There were quite a few things I remember from that trip. The amazingly hostile yet beautiful New Mexico countryside. The plateaus and the campsite. The New Mexican wilderness isn't something a lot of people fantasize about camping in. At least not as far as I know. But Oasis State Park is different. The camping plots are all nice, even if the best are always taken. There's a pretty lake, lots of wildlife, and I hate to admit it, more trees than I've ever seen in town. Yeah, I know nobody thinks of multitudes of trees when they think of New Mexico, and for good reason. They aren't the most common occurrence in the plains, unless planted by people. Regardless, Oasis has enough for me just to use the term woods for the sake of brevity. So anyways, we found ourselves a plot and began setting up our tents. By afternoon the tents were set up and me and my friend ditched his oh so boring younger sister in favour of exploring the park. The memories were fantastic. We found a snake by the lake and watched it drink from the water before slivering off quickly. We explored a place I remember was very sandy. We watched a roadrunner doing its thing. We played all day after lunch and saw so many amazing things that by the end of the day I never would have thought anything could go wrong. We finished the day like you always do, by collecting sticks and starting a fire to eat s'mores and tell ghost stories. None of the stories were scary, probably because me and my friend were kids and his sister was an even younger child. That his father was a lead singer at our church and making children cry was bad for his reputation. So by ghost stories I mean little jokes of stories designed to make us giggle more than cry. Yeah, it was lame, but what do you expect? Anyway, shortly after the stories were said and s'mores were eaten, we retired, me to my tent and my friend, his father and his sister to their tent. Now for this setup I'll explain positioning. This is all going to be important. My tent was at the edge of one plot and my friend's tent was at the exact opposite. This was for privacy reasons. Now at the end of my plot was a mini trail that led through thick brush to the lake. Almost three feet from my tent was a little tree. I don't know what kind of tree it was but I was still young and small. The trail to the lake was to the left of my tent entrance. The lake was behind it, and a thin tree line sat across a trail in front of my tent. That trail in front of my tent led to the bathrooms. So, I went to bed without a single bit of fear, and before I did, I went ahead and urinated on a tree outside my tent because of laziness. Screw the two minute walk to the bathrooms when nature toilet was outside my tent. So, I was finishing closing up my tent for the night and climbed into my sleeping bag to go to bed. I don't know how long I slept, but when I awoke, I had to use the bathroom. And it wasn't the kind of potting I could do on a tree. So I, not being a moron who'd wander through the dark, grabbed my little lantern. 
I flipped on my LED lantern and I unzipped the inner flap of my tent before the outer, as if that little nylon net could protect me from what I was about to see. Now, I should mention that outside of the cities of New Mexico, it's quite common to hear coyote house. It's a nightly occurrence when camping. Heck, even up in a little village like Logan, you can hear the house from your bedroom. It isn't so unnerving when you're in a house. But when you've got some flimsy nylon wall to protect you, and that's it. Well, it isn't the most comforting sound. As I unzipped my tent flap, I did hear a few howls, but then they were distant and not worrying. What stunned me into stillness was a very loud howl from the direction of the lake, about a yard from my tent at most. This howl was different though. It had the feel of a coyote howl, but it was deeper, and it lasted longer. I simply sat there, petrified at what I heard. I wouldn't be able to guess at how long I sat there breathing hard with that breathing hard with my fingers still grasping the zipper, but however long it may have been was just long enough for the thing that made the how to come up the trowel next to my tent. Suddenly I heard the crunching of claws on dirt and after that claws on the rocks that made our camping plots. Then I saw the largest shadow made by a living creature that little kid me had ever seen. It lumbered heavily in the direction of the sparse tree line where I assume the other howling had come from. But before it got past the tree line, I urinated on, it stopped. I realised only then that I was both lit like a candle and had not been trying to silence my heavy breathing. By then, it was too late as the hulking thing lumbered ever closer to the tree and into the light of my lantern. As dim as a little LED light was at that distance, it was just barely enough to make out details. I'd like to note a few very important details that stuck out to me as odd. It had roughly the fur colouring of a coyote, but that classic dogman head shape with the tiny pointed ears, too small to make sense. It also made strange noises as it lowered to all fours in front of my tent, popping sounds like joints rubbing together, as I can only assume its knees busted out of their standing joints and fell into different joints to support all fours. It briefly ignored the very obviously frightened kid me in the tent as it sniffed the tree I had urinated on. The breaths was similar to a dog's, but longer and far deeper, almost like horses. Then, that thing turned to me and stared straight into my eyes. Its eyes didn't glow. They didn't peer into my soul, but they were unbelievably unnatural. Above all things I saw in those eyes, I saw a predator. Have you ever been in a position where you made eye contact with a beast you know is stronger than you? Something you know could just slaughter you. And you know, it knows you know, just looking for seemingly so damn long that I thought for sure I was to be a bloody stain by the time anyone reached my tent. Screaming would do nothing. I doubted a gun would even hurt this thing. But despite every feeling in my gut, despite the dread of knowing it was a predator and I was prey, I didn't die. Instead it turned, slowly, ever so slowly, and just sprinted off into the woods, just gone into the night faster than it had came. I have one personal friend who knows, and he jokes that it was my piss on the tree that made it run away, like I marked my territory or something dumb like that. Or maybe it was just not hungry. Or most improbable, it had just enough morals to not kill a kid. I'll never really know. Needless to say, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just put my lantern away, closed my tent flap, and held it all night. I don't remember sleeping that night at all. I might have, I might not, but if I did, it was dreamless. I do remember that I tried to hide this experience the next day, asking if my friend and his family heard any howling. While they did hear the howling, they told me that they just ignored it, thinking it was the coyote doing the coyote stuff. I was encouraged to just ignore it, as if I was just a city kid who had never heard a coyote howling before. The next day I stayed up as close to my friend as possible while exploring, and had nearly forgotten the encounter by lunch. Somehow, the safety I had been feeling during the day put the beast out of my mind. Until we found tracks in the super sandy place. Coyote tracks. I think seeing those tracks confirmed to me that it wasn't just some dream. And because of that, I showed enough fear that night to convince my friend's family to let me sleep in their tent. Even in the comfort of a warmer tent, more people means more warmth. And in the presence of an adult, the father, 
and two other people, friend and his sister. I couldn't sleep that night. I nearly drifted into sleep and then heard a howl of a coyote. The next day I pretended to be sick and got my mother to drive up and take me home a day or two early. Worst camping trip of my life. It ruined not only my whole summer but also ruined camping. I haven't been camping without a tent buddy since and I don't plan to. Even then I'm never comfortable. Always listening for some strange noises or acting paranoid. This really effed me up I guess. Being forced to see that I, a human, top of the food chain, is utterly powerless in front of such a beast. Seriously, I don't think I can press hard enough to make everyone realise how powerless I felt. Even today when I think about this, I remember two things first. Those eyes and that feeling. Just writing this sent multiple shivers up my spine. That said, you might be asking why I'm talking about this again, if it terrifies me so much. Simple. I both want answers. I want to add to the conversation. I feel the need to add this encounter so that others can experience it. Maybe contact me with questions or answers. So let me say now that if you have any idea what happened that night, please respond or DM. If you have any questions, go ahead and do the same. What? Lurks. Let's get straight into that. It was cold and dark, but at least it wasn't raining anymore. I trudged along the wet, muddy path line in the road, chuntering to myself as I avoided the worst of the puddles. To my left, a decrepit wire fence separated me from the heavily wooded area beyond. I wouldn't normally walk home from work. Usually, I would finish my shift at 10pm and catch the late bus home at half past. But today we were significantly understaffed and I had to stay behind to help lock up the restaurant after midnight. My options were reduced to asking my boss, Martin, for a lift home, or walking five miles in a less than favourable conditions. He gave me an umbrella and his condolences, told me to text him when I got home, and then drove away in his Mercedes-Benz arsehole. I had been walking for about an hour now, my socks were soaked inside my shoes, and my footfalls were punctured by a soft squelch, squelch, squelch that was really starting to get on my nerves. The only sounds were my footsteps and the occasional gentle rustling of a tree branch in the wind. The quiet was unsettling, so I ran the end of the umbrella against the wooden fence piggets that were planted every few feet just to make a bit more noise. Clack, clack, clack. It didn't help. I sighed and picked up the pace, trying to ignore the squelch, squelch, squelch coming from my feet. Only two more miles, and then I would be home. My phone buzzed, and I took it out of my pocket. It was a text from Martin. Are you home yet? I scowled and put it away without answering. Let him worry. Maybe it would make him feel guilty enough to drop me off at least halfway home next time. A cold breeze stirred the leaves in the trees above me, and sent a few skittering across the ground. It felt icy on the back of my neck, and my bare fingers were starting to hurt with the chill. I pulled my fleece jacket tighter around me and hunched over a little more, and the wind eased. The trees were quiet. As I continued to walk, I felt a prickle of unease slowly wind its way up my spine. I shivered and blamed my imagination. Blamed my boss, blamed Joe and Amanda for being ill and taking a sick day. Blamed the bus service for not running my route later than 10.30, because, honestly, that's a little bit ridiculous. What kind of bus service stops after... I heard a faint rustle to my left among the undergrowth. I froze, my eyes searching for the depths of the woodland for any sign of movement, but it was too dark and I couldn't see. A rat? A mouse, maybe. A hedgehog, foraging for food. That was all. Nothing scary about that. I tore my eyes away from the wood and took a moment to breathe. Still, my nerves. Listen. Silence. I shook my head and continued walking at a faster pace, which was now more of a half jog than walk. Squelch, 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 squelch. A small dark shape burst out from the wooden floor in front of me. I jumped and let out a strangled yell, slipped and dropped the umbrella. And I only just caught myself from falling over backwards. The shape scurried across the road and into the bushes on the other side. I cursed myself for being so jittery and was silently thankful 
that no one else had been around to see me almost land butt first in a puddle over a small rat. My heart was hammering in my chest and my hands shook. I picked up the umbrella, which was now covered in a thin film of muddy water mixed with the oil and grease that lined everything at the side of the well-used roads, and glanced once more into the trees before continuing on. My heart stopped and my mouth went dry. Two large red eyes stared at me, unmoving. My throat threatened to close up and my gut churned. I could feel the adrenaline flooding my body and all my instincts were telling me to run, but I stayed rooted to the spot, paralysed by fear. I could only stare back. As I looked, the eyes considered me, and I felt the tiniest itch creep its way into the corner of my mind. I could feel my body begin to twitch ever so slightly, and I thought for a second I was loosening up enough for a bolt, but I realised in horror that the itch was starting to compel me to walk into the tree line, towards the round, unblinking eyes. I twitched again, and I could feel myself very slowly shift my weight onto one foot. My heart was racing and my mind was screaming as I was puppeteered inch by inch closer to the eyes. I tried desperately to run, to change path, to stop moving, to look away, to scream. Nothing worked. I was helpless, trapped and about to die. My legs began to take another step. The red eyes watched, patient and unchanged. The air was silent and still. My last hope of escape was dashed as my foot hit the padded woodland ground unhindered by the wire fence that would have blocked my way if it had been still standing. I felt the lump of the fallen picket under my foot as I shifted my weight yet again for another step. The world seemed to stop existing. All that was left were myself, the eyes and the space between us. The deathly quiet was broken by sudden loud music of my ringtone that I shifted to look for the source of the noise and the itch in my mind petered out giving me a momentary control over my body. I took the opportunity and threw the umbrella like a spear at the ice. Whatever creature they belonged to let out a piercing shriek that sounded like nails on a chalkboard backed by the clicking of a Geiger counter, and the eyes disappeared. I bolted. I ran as fast as I could for as long as I could. It wasn't long before my legs were aching and my lungs were burning, but I pushed on. By the time I was within limits of my hometown, I was ready to collapse. I leaned against the wall and threw up, but I still felt sick. I was shaking so hard I could almost hear the vibrations in my head. And it took all of my remaining strength to just force the air in and out of my lungs. I made myself take a step after another step through the empty streets towards my home. Jumping at every red traffic light and every set of brake lights on the few cars still out at this time. After what seemed like a lifetime, I stumbled through my front door and locked it behind me then went around the house to lock all of my windows and the back door and close all the curtains. I switched on all the lights and turned on the television to the regional channels, cranking up the volume. It only occurred to me later to check who had called me. Martin. I called him back and told him I'd made it home in a small shaky voice and reassured him that no, nothing had happened. I was fine. Just tired, thank you. I had a shower and ate dinner, but I was too shaken to sleep. So I watched television until I heard the birds outside begin to sing. Feeling braver, I wandered into the kitchen, legs still wobbly as sore from running, and began filling the kettle with water. I could see through the curtain that the sky was beginning to lighten with dawn. So I took a breath to still myself and peeked out the window. Nothing. Relief surged through me. Emboldened, I drew the curtain aside halfway for a better view of the garden. Something in my peripheral vision caught my attention, and I felt a small, barely noticeable itch crawl its way into the corner of my mind. Wow, hope you guys enjoyed that compilation of uh, scary stories and the mountains and wilderness, and of course the deep forests. As ever, please do like and share. Uh, it really does help build the show and keep the algorithm numbers up. Uh, welcome also to all of the brand new subscribers. If you haven't subscribed to DMT, please do smash the subscribe button and tickle the notification bell to stay up to date with all DMT content. As ever guys, remember, if you're out hiking or backpacking or simply taking a weekend camping trip in the boonies, 
Keep your eyes and ears open and be aware of your surroundings. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>